So thank you very much for doing this interview at short, very short notice. Could you tell me your name and your age? Um, my name is Heilid. My age is 45 years old. Yeah. And um, you, you talked a little earlier, mm -hmm. and I discovered that you were um, your great great uncle mm -hmm. uh, was a very famous mm -hmm. Chinese writer. Mm -hmm. Um, can uh, call Lin Yu Tang. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit, any anecdotes or stories about him? You were saying that he usually wrote in English, yeah. but then when he translated it into Chinese, mm -hmm. he re rewrote it. Yeah. Well, I think he, he was a certain a great writer, and uh, when you read his English writing and when you read Chinese writing, you get a completely different flavor. Because each language has its own cultural context. Mm -hmm. So when you read his Chinese writing, you can see the structures in it's more of a Chinese traditional Chinese context. So in a sense that it's more understandable by, by Chinese. Mm -hmm. When you read his English writing, it's, it's, it's written and in along the English language logic, right? Because we are all the product of our culture and cultural context. So when you do one-to-one -one literary translation, a lot of messages actually lost, mm. and uh, more is lost is the musicality mm. of the writing. Each each writing has its own natural rhythm, mm. and how you build toward a certain climax, mm. and how de how you delineate certain message. So in the different culture, uh, the way they delineate is a little bit different. So that's why I personally quite enjoy reading his uh, English writing first, then uh, reading his Chinese writing. Mm. Which language do you think he thought in? Uh, personally, I think his English writing is usually better than his uh, Chinese writing. Uh, Do you think he thought in English? I think he certainly thought in English. I can clearly see that. Mm. I can clearly see that. But having said that, I do notice that uh, the writing he wrote in the early age and a, a later age are different. And uh, in a later age, obviously when he returned uh, to Taiwan, and I can see his writing is more along the traditional Chinese way than his earlier writing. So certainly, his writing style changed. Mm. Mm. Do you think his central aim was to explain China to the West, or the West to China? I, I think it certainly functioned that way. He certainly is the best ambassador of Chinese culture to the West, and he's certainly also a great ambassador of Western culture into Chinese. But personally, as a family member, our view to, toward him is a little bit different. I think he, in his whole life, he has been trying to resolve a personal conflict because he was brought up as a Christian, right? Mm -hmm. he, his father is a pastor, and it, but he grew up in China. And as he, I think that part of two culture, the conflict of two culture in him uh, is best show in his writing called From Pagan to Christian, right? Mm -hmm. He personally struggled with his faith first mm -hmm. because he was brought up as a Christian. Then uh, he found that uh, his Christian faith did not quite explain the suffering uh, he witnessed in the in the 1920 and 30 in, in, in China, and then he he went into a traditional Chinese wisdom, went into the Lao Tzu's philosophy, went into Confucius' philosophy, even went to the Buddhism, mm. and trying to find the answer why good people suffer, mm. why Chinese as a society seems to be condemned, mm. right? It seems to losing his way, and once a great civilization suddenly sees itself really in the mud, mm. and he, he cannot find the answer. Then, then the, his uh, favorite study all this uh, traditional Chinese wisdom, and he also favorite study the Western philosophy. To me, his, the outcome of it, he himself explaining the West to China, uh, explaining the China to the West, is a direct outcome of his personal struggle. Mm. So, as a family member, we have a different perspective about him. Mm. Do you think uh, he thought it, that it was possible mm -hmm. <coughs> to bring these two civilizations together and um, to make them coherent mm -hmm. without losing the inner essence of either of them, because this was a problem that Liang Xiaochao, yeah. who must have influenced him, yeah. uh, faced and didn't ever really resolve. Yeah. I think, in the sense that we, as a, as a family, are coming from the coming from the 
really by cultural background. I, I think the essential thought would be, yes, you will come to it. Because of, uh, as a Christian, we all believe that heaven shine the sunlight mm. onto pagan, also onto a Christian. They bring a wisdom to all people around the world. So if it's good things that heaven has given to the humankind, let us know such a one gift for Chinese, one gift for non-Chinese, one gift for Westerner, and one gift for non-Westerner. Everything good comes from heaven. And ultimately, whatever good bring into the civilization, either it be a Chinese civilization or Western civilization or Babylonian civilization or in, Indian civilization, they are all gift from heaven. So if it, if it all come from one source, they are supposed to be coherent, mm -hmm. right? And as a scientist, we certainly have no difficulty of understanding this. For example, like mathematics. Mm -hmm. Is there a Chinese mathematic or mm -hmm. English mathematic? No, it's just mathematic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Is there a Chinese physic or English physic? No, it's just a physic. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing we believe uh, even in this culture, although the culture might look different from our world, but when you really strip down to its essence, it's still about a human being. A human being very much experience the same feeling, right? So ultimately, you're all about the family, about your love, how do you live, right? When you strip away all those rituals and all the outward look, the most of culture are actually remarkably alike. So, so in a sense that uh, I think the difference we, we are facing today, or different we are difference we are talking about, are being exaggerated. So ultimately, I believe it's through another another a century, maybe. I'm being pessimist, right? Another century, the world will, are going to become much more alike than than different. Are you a Christian yourself? Oh, I'm a Christian, yes, sir. Yes, yes, I thought from your answer yeah. that was the case. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so now moving on to mm. uh, your own work, can you mm. tell me what, yes. what work you, you do? Well, I'm a chemical engineer by training, so and uh, I, s I run a startup in Shenzhen, so I have my own company and I'm ma making the environmental friendly pigment for the, for the automotive industry. Mm. And what is the point of this pigment? What will it do? Uh, the, those, are, those are the metallic pigments which give a brilliant look to, to the auto coating, right? Mm. When you're looking at a car, mm. it looks bright. Mm. And mm. the one who provides the brightness and provides the refraction is a metallic pigment inside mm. the coating. So we are in a very, very specialized field mm. of, a, of a chemical industry called the pigment industry. Mm. Essentially, that's a current industry. Mm. Mm. And yeah, as you mentioned, this is in Shenzhen. Yeah. Um, we've been to Shenzhen mm -hmm. three times and mm -hmm. been enormously impressed by it. Mm -hmm. And you said earlier that there were things going on in Shenzhen mm -hmm. which were not widely known but were mm -hmm. going to contribute to the ecological and other development of the world. Mm -hmm. Can you single out one or two of those? Well, I think one thing is that people always think that China as a latecomer into the Industrial Revolution will be the follower mm. of uh, whatever West are doing, right? And then they are going to walk in the same step uh, as most of industrial nation has come. But one thing I have been observing, because in the last five years I've been living in Shenzhen, they are not necessarily following the exact same path. For, for instance, when we develop this uh, uh, coating replacement pigment, and when we developed this uh, water bomb pigment, we were the first one in the world to adopt it. And the first user, it's not a, those are global company, but rather a Chinese domestic Chinese company, which want to leapfrog in this wave of a uh, green industry. So, in a sense that uh, although China lay to the game of uh, industrial revolution, they are not necessarily lay in their mind in watching out what is next to come. So, so that's that's one thing about unique about Shenzhen. This is an immigrant city. city. So, all immigrant from all the inland from China, they come to this place not to really say that get a job. They come to this city to make something different. They come to this city to make a, a living for, for themselves. So this Shenzhen is a city of entrepreneur. So they are daring to try. Because following someone's footsteps only guarantee you are always behind. Right? So they are, they are willing to try, they are willing to take risks to try something new. So that's one great characteristic about Shenzhen. Mm. So do you think in the next 20 or 30 years, mm. Shenzhen, perhaps other cities, will 
cat shark with the west coast of America? Uh, personally, I believe it's probably in terms of its spirit, I think it's already catch up. Mm. It, Shenzhen is very much California. Mm. It's very, very much California in its uh, spirit. I think in terms of a uh, technology level, I would say that each city will have its own specialty. Shenzhen ultimately will win in uh, artificial intelligence, anything to do with the electronic, and uh, because the entire ecosystem is here. Mm. So I think Shenzhen will be great in those areas. And we'll be ahead of America. We'll be ahead of, I believe it will be ahead of America in those areas. But in other areas, let's say the traditional mechanical engineer, less such as uh, making an uh, engine power or anything mm. like that, I think America will still be the leader. Mm. Uh, in terms of uh, medicine, advanced medicine, I think 20 years from now, I think Shenzhen will be still in the catching up phase. I, I personally still believe that will be the game still of California and uh, also New England. Mm. Of, uh, of U.S. So yeah. that's my personal view. You are going to see that out of uh, 20 ish of a key important area for the 21st century, Shenzhen will probably be the world leader in the two or three area, mm -hmm. and uh, and the fast follower in the in the rest. That's that's how I position him in the next 20 years. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine any one city uh, can be so dominant. Mm -hmm. let's, let's say that captured a, a quarter of a. Uh, mm -hmm. important area. It's hard for me to see that because uh, even in its prime, Boston never done it. Mm -hmm. Even in its prime, the, uh, LA and San Francisco and San Jose have never done it. And in my view, Shenzhen will probably do extremely well in uh, two or three areas. And will other cities like Shanghai and Guangzhou and mm -hmm. uh, Chengdu also do very well in one or two? I think they will catch, I think they will follow the step of uh, Shenzhen, but they are the city of a different characteristic. The way I, I never view Shanghai as a technology center mm -hmm. because uh, Shanghai already have too much history and culture into it. So Shanghai will still be the great financial center of China. Mm -hmm. And uh, it will be a great city to interact with the West, with uh, the rest of the world. But it's hard for me to see sh Shanghai mm -hmm. as an uh, innovator for technology. There will probably be innovation in the, in the business model uh, or mm -hmm. banking and so on and so forth. But I, hardly for me to imagine Shanghai be a technology leader. And as for Guangzhou, Guangzhou has traditionally been a great uh, commercial city. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be a lot of innovation on uh, I, I would see they would do well in the e-commerce and all mm. kind of anything related to the to the commerce, but I do not see them as a technology leader either, mm. because each city has their own character. The history has been built into it. You can unwritten the history. Mm. Shenzhen is different. This is an immigrant city. Each group of people bring their own baggage, but they also leave the baggage behind when they come to the city. So that's why Shenzhen is more like, that's a, for lack of a better word, it's an old New York, mm -hmm. right? When the Irish, when the Italian, when the, when the people from the Holland, from, the, from Germany, all come into Manhattan to mm -hmm. build a new city from the ground up. So that's why I say, I believe Shenzhen will be unique and uh, it will be unique uh, even, let's say, 100 years from now. Mm -hmm. And so whether, so it will go down in history as a truly the first immigrant city mm -hmm. of China. And in terms of Chengdu, which is an interesting one, is inland, it's a, it's a located, it's a geographically very, very conveniently co located. But I do see Chengdu become the, the a capital of the West, of, of China's West. So in a sense, I envision Chengdu is more, somewhat like a San Francisco <laughs> to California. And it will become a new great center. It will have its culture, it will have its science, but it will not be a specialist city like Shenzhen. Do you, uh, I mean, we're having this conversation 40 years since mm -hmm. Deng Xiaoping opened up yeah. China, and one of the great turning points mm -hmm. a few years later was when Shenzhen was made yeah. into a special economic zone. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it feels, or it is easier to innovate in Shenzhen still because it is sort of given special status and separation yeah. from the rest of China? I, I think that definitely is a pretext mm. to Shenzhen's innovation. Without Deng Xiaoping making Shenzhen a special, uh, a special administration zone, Shenzhen will not have what he accomplished today. So that's a pretext. But Shenzhen is much more beyond what it was 
back then. Shenzhen's innovation is really not quote unquote protected by the policy uh, given by the central government, but rather under that umbrella, initially, uh, Deng Xiaoping set up for Shenzhen. Shenzhen has grew to the city, has its unique characteristic. First of all, Shenzhen, if you look at it, it's a public servant system. It's very much different from the rest of China. It's much less bureaucratic. It's goal-oriented, right? Yeah. Particularly, it's uh, all uh, financial goal-oriented. You, uh, you, you set a plan for certain GDP growth that we have to attract X number of companies to come over, X amount of uh, investment to come in. So it's much result-oriented uh, public servant system. Secondly, it's a legal system. It's much more transparent and open than the rest of China. So that provides a better... How did, how did that happen? How did that happen is uh, because these are the pe people... That's why when I mentioned earlier, the people come to Shenzhen, mm. they, come, they are the risk takers. They mm. come here, they leave their baggage behind. In the new system, you don't have to give, with Chinese called a old guan xi, mm. right? You don't have to take, you don't have to worry about those things. Mm. And, uh, and the legal system do function here uh, with less influence from the political will. Mm. So in a sense that it provides the entrepreneur with better protection. Mm. Without the proper protection of uh, each entrepreneur's own wealth and also its company, the economic system just doesn't function. So when I mentioned it, it's an effective public service system, mm. more transparent legal system than the rest of China, that's the second. Third things in Shenzhen which still make, although it's very expensive, still make it the most innovative city in Shenzhen is it, people. Mm. Young people still believe in its Chinese dream. They come here for the Chinese dream. It's the same thing like an Irish went to America for the American dream. They still believe a self-made man can can still make it happen in Shenzhen. Right? In China, so the rest of China, let's say the more inland China, that doesn't happen. If you are not born being a sons and daughter of senior official, if you're not born being a let's say a wealth wealthy class, there are very, very little chance for you to have any sort of our mobility. But Shenzhen is different, right? Because it's so mobile and uh, there are so many enterprises here. There are many, many chains are still open to those people who come here with an empty hand. Mm. Well, thank you. That was a longer interview than we'd planned, but because it was so interesting. Thank you so much. You're welcome.